His talk today is entitled, All the Elements of Sublimity and Terror, Veterans and the Psychological Impact of War. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Goldman. Many of today's combatants were in general military service or reserve and national guard. Almost all the units during the Civil War were state units. The exceptions being the units that were um, enfolded into the U.S. colored troops, the USCT, and men who served in regular army units. This is a very important distinction as to why you've enlisted and what you're fighting for. Because wars are ideological. And it is critical to examine the beliefs of the soldiers as to why they fought, what it meant, and whether their sacrifice was worth what they had done, and how they rehabilitate themselves and re-enter society. As Mao Zedong said, politics is war without bloodshed, or war is politics with bloodshed. Now, William Oldham Bourne was a clergyman and a journalist. He was the chaplain at Central Park Hospital during the war. He edited what was called The Soldier's Friend, which was a periodical mostly for wounded veterans, and he donated the papers to the Library of Congress in 1931. And they came to my attention because my friend, Dr. John Sellers, who was then the Civil War Lincoln and Reconstruction Specialist at the, National, at the uh, Library of Congress, wanted to know if I thought there was value in this collection and I should keep it on active status. <laughs> I looked at it for about 10 minutes and said, do not retire this collection. That was 14 years ago. I've been curating it ever since. There's two parts of the collection. There are autograph books that Bourne kept of men who were in the hospital. Now those men were generally amputees. So that um, Central Park Hospital was an early tertiary care hospital because men were sent there to be fitted for their prosthetic devices or get reamputation surgery. So that's one part of the collection. That's what my first article was based on. The second part, absolutely stunning, was a national handwriting contest where Bourne wanted to get men to learn how to use their, their left hands by having men who had lost the use of their right arms and you had to submit a deposition that you would lost the use of your right arm and it was a penmanship contest. <coughs> there were 270 contestants and when I analyzed the population I couldn't believe what I, what I had stumbled upon. When you read what they had to say in 1865 Union soldiers held Confederate soldiers in contempt for what they were fighting for, not as soldiers. There was no common ground in that sense between the Union and the North. Confederate soldiers held Union soldiers for the most part in contempt, not only for what they were fighting for, but they refused to acknowledge their work as soldiers. Hence, you've had the lost cause mentality that the North never won the war, and that they were not defeated as Gettysburg, that the Gettysburg was the fault, of course, of James Longstreet, and jubilarily, and um, was not what Pickett later said, the greatest one-line comment in the history of the Civil War, when they asked Pickett why he had lost Pickett's charge, his one-line comment was, I think the Union Army had something to do with it. <laughs> something which historians have ignored for the last 150 years. Soldier's Pride, Lewis Booth, 6th Pennsylvania. He talks about when he came back from being held prisoner at City Point. And what does he see? He sees the flag flying and what it means to him. I felt proud I was an American citizen and that I was in the ranks of its army. This cannot be overstated. Don't forget, these men were born at a time where they probably knew their grandfathers who had served in the American Revolution. They, what did Lincoln call the American Republican democracy? The last best hope of Earth. It was still considered an experiment in democracy. These men knew it. But they also knew this. They knew what it was like to go to war. Frederick Platt, 10th, 10th Connecticut. The emotions he felt when he left home, the hardships and privations of a soldier's life on land and in crowded transports, the occasional sports in camp, including baseball, by the way, which was not invented by Abner Doubleday, the excitement of battle, the ghastly spectacle of men mutilated by shot and shell or worn by pestilential fevers. These have been shared by so many brave men. I will leave for a pen more graphic than mine to describe. Does this seem like a simple handwriting contest to you? They had no idea what these men were going to write. By the way, this is an anonymous enlisted man with limited education. Look at the way they write. 
These were literate white men who thought deeply about why they were fighting. And by the way, they were ahead of Abraham Lincoln in a lot of ways, as I'll show you. Rufus Dawes, who I will be discussing in depth tomorrow at the Historical Society. A percussion shell struck and exploded in the very center of the moving mass of men, killed two men and wounded 11, and tore off Captain David K. Noy's foot, cut off both arms of a man and his company. This dreadful scene occurred within a few feet of where I was riding before my eyes. Thus opened the Battle of Antietam, still the bloodiest day in American history. John Bryson, 30th New York. John Bryson wanted to see a battlefield until he actually saw one. And when he went to see what had happened, he found that the hands and feet of Confederate soldiers were protruding from their graves, later finding pigs rooting among the remains of the soldiers who were shadowly buried there. He knew they were traitors. He felt what they were, what they were fighting for was, was unfathomable, but they were fellow human beings and was watching them. I turned away full of sadness from the scene with a silent but fervent prayer that the cruel strife would cease in our land. I desired to visit no more battlefields. He did visit more battlefields until he lost the use of his right, right hand. John Bryson became the first superintendent of Cypress Hill Cemetery in Brooklyn, one of the largest Union veteran cemeteries later the superintendent of the uh, Union Cemetery in Louisville. He also became one of the finest amateur geologists in the United States. His writings on the formation of Long Island are considered classics. War is hell, but that's not the half of it, because war is also mystery and terror, adventure and courage and discovery, and holiness and pity and despair and longing and love. Love. War is nasty, war is fun, war is thrilling, war is drudgery. War makes you a man, war makes you dead. The great Tim O'Brien, the things they carried, Vietnam Railroad. 